Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see so many of you. Exciting this week. Uh, this week, our youth group just got back from youth camp. It's so glad to see all of our uh, youth kids, youth, uh, youth parents. It's really excited to be able to see you today. Um, today, if you're visiting with us today, uh, if you're a visitor with us, we have multiple ways that we can be able to get in contact with you. We have a blue sheet that's right back there on the back of the paper, and we also have a bulletin if you got it when you walked in. You can be able to tear out a sheet and let us know, give us some information about just who you are. I promise you, I'll call you. If you put your name on it, I'll call you. And uh, it'll be really exciting just to be able to contact and know that you're here with us today. Before we start, we're going to do worship. We're going to preach God's word today. And we're going to be in Matthew. But before we do, we want to pray for our country. We want to pray for former President Trump. And just that idea, because what I, what I woke up to this morning was, was kids with a lot of questions. And they were like, Dad, I can't believe this can happen. What kind of world do we live in that things like this can actually happen? And I'll, and I'll be honest, it's, it's, it's a wild world. Now, for a lot of people who maybe are an older generation, you remember this happening actually a lot. In my generation, we've never happened. Maybe when I was a kid, I remember Reagan being shot at. But the idea is that we live in a scary world, and I will say this, if we allow that fear to control us, the enemy wins. Okay? The way the news works is that they try to create fear inside of each and every heart, and that causes you to plug in and watch and be controlled by whatever thing they want to tell you. And I tell you this right now, we win. Jesus wins. He's, he's the king. He's who we follow. Who's who we, he's who we, we cheer for. When it comes down to it, I, I don't care what side you, you vote for. I pray that you vote for the right one. I'm not going to tell you which one. But here's what I know. God didn't create us with a spirit of fear. He created us to be able to live a victorious life that we go and tell about the things that God has done. And, and this is what I hope you do, is that you don't look for opportunities this week to just sit around and gossip and just to talk about how bad it is and how it was better when we were younger. But instead, you talk about how Jesus still changed lives and he still transforms hearts even today. And that's what we need to be about. That's what us as a, as a church needs to be about, not about garnering fear. So let's pray. Let's pray for our country, and let's just pray for ourselves and pray that Jesus' name is be lifted up high. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everyone that's in this room. And God, we thank you for allowing us to be Americans. For God, we can be born anywhere in this world. And Lord, we need to realize that that is a gift in itself. That God, we can understand freedom and liberty. And we understand that it took people, people's blood to be able to have those things. But God, I pray, Lord, that we as Christians, Christians first, that we don't live in a state of fear where we're scared of what could happen or what might happen tomorrow, but we know who holds tomorrow, and it's you. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can be able to put our faith and trust in you more than we put our faith and trust in anything and everyone else. God, I pray, Lord, that our convictions would lead us to the way we vote. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would understand that the only thing that really matters is that our, it's about our soul. And we're a part of your kingdom and your world. Lord, let us not be controlled by the fear that's, that surrounds us, but let us be strong in what, in what you say. For that is the truth. That's what we can believe in. That you come and set people free like us who are sinners, who are broken and need a Savior. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In your name we pray, amen. So what I want you to do, I want you to stand up. I want you to say hi to someone beside you, but this is what I want you to do. Give them a hug. Tell them hi. Say hi.
let's come together and let's sing about our Christ. We have reason to celebrate because our Christ has risen. Let's sing that. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Amen. He welcomes the prodigals. The prodigal is welcomed home. The sinner now a saint. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. We sing, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. O oh, praise his name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave, and all throughout eternity, our song will be the same, hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. We rejoice in that day. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sin? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. Darkness, your loving kindness. 
tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has Sing, be thou my vision. 
our wisdom. Lord, you are our vision. Lord, you are our wisdom. Lord, you are in our inheritance. God, you are so good. And today, as we come desperately in need of encouragement and of hope and of peace and of joy, we find it all in your presence. God, simply sitting at your feet and hearing your word be taught to us. God, being in prayer with you. We receive those things as a byproduct of your presence. And so this morning, we let everything go. God, we set aside our distractions, and we come humbly and urgently to your feet to receive the peace and the encouragement and the joy and the hope that we so desperately need. And you are faithful to give us those things because your scriptures say that it is true. And so we pray that that would be true for us this morning. God, we love you, and we desperately want to see more of you. We pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, we are going to continue through a time of 
corporate prayer. And how this will work is I'll read a prompt to you, and then you're going to take the next couple of moments and pray either individually on your own, or you can pray with your families or your friends or your spouse or a stranger. This time is simply open for you to commune with the Father. That's the goal. And however you do that would be great. Um, So this morning, Clint is going to continue through this series of Jesus' miracles post-Sermon on the Mount. And this morning, we're going to look at these two men who were demon-possessed, and Jesus rids them of the demons. And basically what we see is Jesus moves these men from a place of being spiritually unhealthy to a place of being spiritually healthy. And so we're going to just pray through that idea this morning. And so as I said, I'm going to read this prompt to you, and if you would take the next few moments and pray, then we will read through the next couple of prompts. So the first one is just take a moment and analyze and confess your spiritual health. So take a moment and just reflect on where you are spiritually and confess that to the Lord. Next, would you pray for your spiritual health to be increased? Finally, the prompt says pray for our church's spiritual health to be increased, but let's, let's broaden that. Would you pray for our community, for our state, for our nation, and for our world, and for the spiritual health across the world to be increased? Lord, there may be so many different situations going on in this room. God, there may be uh, people here that have sins in our lives that we have struggled to uh, let go and to see healing in for years. God, some of us are just heartbroken. Some of us are confused and lost. And some of us think we're fine, but we're really not. And so my prayer for us as a body of believers this morning is that as we have come together as we have worshiped and lifted our praises to you and sang our hearts out and as we sit down and as we look through your scriptures to see what you have to say for us this morning god would you increase our spiritual health lord would you turn us into believers that are even more on fire for you believers that that run after you more believers that find refuge in you and in you alone. God, if we have things in the way that are blocking our view of you, would you help us to repent from those things and to lay them aside through the power of your Holy Spirit? God, would you heal our hearts and our minds and our souls to find the peace and the joy and the hope and the encouragement that you provide in your presence? And Lord, if we have nothing else to give this morning, because we don't, God, would you Just simply let our our being in your presence enough to fill our hearts with those things. 
And we know that you are faithful and ready to give us those things. And so we pray that you would help us to receive those, those amazing blessings that you give to your believers. God, would your spirit fill our hearts and our minds and our souls with the amazing things that you have to offer. God, we love you and we pray for this time. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Awesome. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you, Grace. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8. We are going to continue where we were, um, where we left off last week. Last week, we talked about um, two men who went to Jesus, asked them if they could be disciples. This week, we will talk about the storm and a little bit more after that. Um, it's funny that Austin talks about um, the idea of our souls. Like, what's funny about the idea of souls is that we live past this life. That there is a life after this. And either for every one of us in this room, we think about this maybe way too much or we don't think about this enough. And, and, I, and I think when it comes down to most of us in this room, when's the last time you asked about how your soul's doing? And even in those questions and what we prayed about, he was able to explain that to us of a saying that, when's the last time we, th we thought about this? When's the last time we talked about, what's the condition of your soul? And you're going, well, I, I know I'm saved. Great. Still, how's your soul doing? H how's your spiritual growth? We're, al we're always about, you know, financial growth. We're always about maybe like, you know, growth as a person because I'm trying to learn more or maybe I'm trying to be a better dad or a better employee or a better at this but how is your soul in the idea of the way its growth is are we getting closer and closer to Jesus or are we just saying oh I'll do that when I when I can last week we talked about two disciples and those two disciples that came to Jesus saying I want to follow you I want to follow you and one of them wasn't willing to leave the comforts of this world to be able to follow Jesus. And the other one, he, he was preoccupied by having to go bury his father, but really we find out that his father was not dead. His father was dying. But he was saying, oh, I'll, I'll follow you after this. I'll follow you after this. And there's so many of us that we live in that same exact scenario. And then we see Jesus that gets on a boat and tells his people, hey, we're going to go on the other side of the sea, and we're going to, and, and, and I'll be honest, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know where they were going and what they were doing, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is really what was going on. You'll see a map. You can have the map on there. It's fine. Um, we have a map, and I'm going to show you a map. Uh, Tabo, would you put that map back on there? Thanks, sir. Um, we're going to show a map, and I want you to really understand this map. Um, you're asking there's no reason for me to take a seminary class. You're not. But I want you to understand where they are, and I want you to understand like how far they went from point A to point B, especially in these stories. Now, right here in this place right here, this is Capernaum. This is where Jesus would have been his headquarters. That's where he would have always been. That's where Peter lived. You could go there today and still see Peter's house. Like I said the other day, there's a church that's built over Peter's house. Over here in this area, in this, in this area right here, this is where the Sermon on the Mount most likely take, took place. This is where the site of which it was taking place here. Now, as we see here, this is the Sea of Galilee. This is the River Jordan. This is where he gets, where he gets baptized and baptizes here. Down here below, probably at the very bottom of here, this is about where Jerusalem would be. If we think about Samaria, even the idea of Samaria would be down here. Before you get into Judea, you would have Samaria. That was where he, the woman at the well would have been met. And multiple things like that have happened. But what we see in this side, this side was foreign lands. This side was a place in which Gentiles would have lived, but not Jewish people. Jewish people would have lived in, this, in the land of Galilee and would have lived in the land of Judea. Now, I say this, this is important. Where Jesus goes, just imagine this. Imagine you're one of his disciples, especially in the story that we're going to read. And you would go this, because I don't know about you, when, when I'm driving from point A to point B, my friends and my wife will look at me and go, 
Why are we going this way? You go the long way in every scenario, and I really do. Like if I drive in Nacogdoches, I drive down Appleby Sand Road. It's faster the other way. I know it's faster the other way, but it's not prettier the other way, okay? I like driving. I want to see the pretty side. I want to see the nice, big, giant side of the road. I want to see all these things. But I don't really have any intention. I completely have no intention of why I drive down Appleby Sand Road. I have no intention at all. But it doesn't help my time. It actually probably hurts my time. It also puts me right there at the, uh, at the school, and I also might get stopped by a train. There's all these things that might get me in my way. But what's funny is, is that what Jesus does is he goes a different way, but he has a purpose behind it. He has a reason. And what we see here today in this story is right where we left off. When we, when we left there, and I want to go back, and I, wanna, I want you to read verse 27 of chapter 8. The, 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 the disciples get into the boat. And this is what they say at the very end of verse 27. It says, And the men were marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the wind and seas obey him? And and this is the perspective I want you to look at this whole entire day today. How do you think the disciples looked at Jesus after seeing him do all these different things? How do you think he looked at they looked at Jesus going, Who is this man? who can do all these amazing things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read. I'm going to reread 23. I'm going to read 23 all the way through 34. But we're going to camp out here just for a little while, and then we're going to move on. Okay? So look here, verse 23. If you would, stand. Let's stand as we honor God's word. Stand if you can. We're going to honor God's word by reading of God's word. Verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was swamped by waves. But he was asleep. And they went and they woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? Verse 28. And when they came to the other side of the country of the Gardeans, the two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass the way. And behold, they cried out, have you, have, what have you come here to torment us before the time? Now I heard a pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the water. The herdsmen fled, going into the city. And they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Let's pray. God, I thank you. For the story, God, I thank you that you made the extra long trip to be able to heal this man. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would understand and that we would be able to hear with our ears, see with our eyes, and hear with our hearts. That, God, that we can be able to see that this story is really a lot about us. And that we have a lot of things that we have in common with this demon-possessed man. And God, I pray, Lord, that you speak to us through it. In your name we pray, amen. Now, I want you to understand this. Now, you're saying, if you look in chapter 9, this is what I want you to do. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9, here's the stories that are coming up. Jesus heals the paralytic. Verse 9, so nine, chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus calls Matthew. Jesus is calling, in chapter 9, the man who wrote this story. In the three first Gospels, so here's the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are eyewitness accounts of what Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. These three Gospels are very similar in the way that they were written. They are written in a story form ideas of what happened in a chronological order of what was going on in Jesus' ministry. Now, these are very important that we understand. 
that all three of these Gospels explain and have the same purpose behind every story. But they do have variations amongst the stories. That in this story, in Matthew's version, there's two men. But in Mark and Luke, there's just one man. Now listen to me, that's okay. That's an okay thing to have. I was just talking to um, Scott Peel, who's an attorney, and I asked him before, he, right when he walked to the door, because I wanted to know, I want to know, if you have three people who come to you and tell you a story, will their stories be the same? And he said, absolutely not. If they are the exact same, I think something fishy is going on. So if they were exactly the same, exactly right. Now I say this again, Matthew was not on this trip, but he records this trip because he was multiple years with Jesus. He writes all this down because Matthew, his intent of writing his entire gospel is to prove that Jesus is the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. Luke's purpose is to show exactly from the chronicalizing all the way from the Christmas story all the way to the end of Acts. He's living in the days of Acts, and so he uses Luke, and he uses Acts to explain the whole story of the beginning of Christianity. Okay? Mark is Peter's disciple. He sits down, and he writes down whatever Peter just told him. Peter was an illiterate fisherman, and he was saying, all right, you talk, I'll write. And that's exactly how it works. So all three of these stories, we would say that, man, they're, they're all so similar. But some stories... Others have better accounts. Mark wasn't there, but his story was very, very good. Peter explained it and had told it very, very well. But we're also not going to just look. I don't want you just to see just Matthew's story. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 8. Okay? If you wanted to look at Mark's story, it would be in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. But don't turn there. Mark chapter 5, 1 through 20. That's 20 verses. And you're going, oh my goodness, that's a lot of verses for Clint. I know. But if you go to Luke chapter 8, it's just as many. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. <clears throat> now, when you hear the story about a demon-possessed man, we have a lot of people who scoff at this who will sit there and say, Jesus, listen, I don't believe in all those demon-possessed stories or even the story. And, and, and when it comes down to us in the world that we live in today, we want proof, fact, and a matter of fact, all these different things. What is weird and strange about this is that we today have a hard time believing in Satan, that either Satan doesn't exist or maybe demons don't exist or angels don't exist or even the supernatural, or even the idea that when we die, we go to heaven or we go to hell. We, we find it in our, in our truth is that we would rather not even think about these things than understand that they're true. The Bible in multiple different ways says how important it is that we fight not just flesh and blood. That in Ephesians 6, 12 says, Paul says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And what we're going to talk about is how Jesus heals this man from a demon possessed, that it, it drove him mad. The purpose of demons is to be able to destroy what God created to destroy God's creation. So no matter if you believe it or not, acknowledge that Jesus believed it. And here's what's even more amazing. They acknowledged Jesus. That the demon knew who Jesus was, knew what he was all about. And we're going to see this in the story. Charles Valery, who was a French writer in the early 1800s, and it was in a movie not too long ago, and it said this, the greatest trick that the devil ever pulled is making people believe that he didn't exist. And you think about it. Some of us are fooled today. That we think that demonic powers and even spirits, evil as they are, cannot possess a man. And listen to me, they can. And they do. 
So when we understand this and we see these scriptures and we read this stuff, we hopefully that we understand that Jesus goes to heal this man because he was hurt and he was sick. So look there, verse verse 8, chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 26. Let's read. And I'm going to need my map again. Sorry, uh, Tavo. I keep on asking you to bring me a map. Verse 26, it says this. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes. Now, now it did not say Gerasenes in the other one. It says the Gadarenes. Now, I want you to understand this. This is the Gadarene area. This is the Gerasene area. Okay? Matthew wasn't there. They, they, they got in a boat. They basically had the storm right here in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. They came all the way over here to the Gerasene area, and this would have been Gentile area. All of this area would have been Gentile area. The Jewish people had no business being there. So if you're a disciple, you're sitting here saying, listen, we just got on a boat. It almost killed us. Where are we going now? What is so worth coming over here for? Why would we come this far for this? Verse 26, and they sailed across the country of the Gerasenes, which is the opposite of the Galilee. When Jesus stepped out onto the land, there he was met with a, a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he wore no clothes and had now lived in the house among the tombs, that he lived in this graveyard. So if you look there in verse, verse 26, I want you to see this. This is called Decapolis, okay? This would have been an area where people would have been, like it would have been basically where Jordan is today. This area where the people who would be considered here would have been heathens. Um, they would have been against anything that was Jewish. And you're going to see there's a whole herd of pigs. Well, who doesn't eat pigs? Jewish people. Jewish people would not have had pigs. Therefore, the herd of pigs was there to be able to be considered as wealth. It would be considered as these people would have had these. And, there, and it said this. It said there was probably a herd of pigs. When they say that, most likely 1,000, if not 2,000 pigs were in the presence here. That's a lot of pigs. I don't think I want to smell it or be around it. But if what's funny about this story is that we have to understand how far Jesus went and where he went. Because again, if you're a disciple, you're going, where are we going? Why do we need to go this far? And why do we need to go to this land that's just filled with all these heathens, filled with all these unclean pigs? Verse 27, the demon-possessed man was naked, for he was living in a graveyard amongst the tombs. Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel says that this man was so dangerous and violent that no one would come near the road, that, that, that he was a dangerous man, that he was a scary man, that no one wanted to come by. It, if we, a couple years ago, we got to go to Branson and got to see a reenactment of Jesus, and we got to actually see this reenactment happen. And, and it still sticks in my memory that the demon speaks through the man. Look there at verse 28. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of God, oh, the Son of the Most High God? Now, here's why that's important. Because in Matthew, he calls him the Son of God. Remember what Jesus calls himself even before in Matthew? He says, I'm the Son of Man, proving that he's the Messiah, that he's the one who's the promised one. In this, the demon calls him out. In Matthew, calls him the Son of God. In Luke and in Mark, he calls him Son of the Most High God. The demon knows who Jesus is. When, when the disciples are on the boat saying, what kind of man is this? And the demons say, why are you here, son of the most high God? The demons knew. The demons knew who Jesus was. What's funny about this is that the whole entire point of, I think, of what Satan tries to do is convince us that there is no sin, there is no hell, there is no heaven, there's nothing like that. It's all about what you live like today. So just get what you can, live for yourself, and all these things. When they know the truth, and they do everything they can to keep me and you from it. Of thinking about our souls. 
Because if I ask you, when's the last time you thought about your soul? When's the last time you thought about Jesus? Your condition, like when you die, where do you go? And even now, are you becoming more like the world or are you becoming more like him? In, the, in, the, in Matthew, the demon says to Jesus, have you come here to tor- torment us before the time? At, at the time, he says, have you come to torment us before the time? And this is exactly what he says. This is a Matthew only. He sa- he's saying, have you come to torment us before the time of judgment? He knew judgment was coming. He knew that where his place where he belonged, he knew that he belonged in hell to burn. He knew it. The demon knows theology, knows theology better than we do, acknowledges where he's going to spend all of eternity, and yet it's us who either don't acknowledge Jesus at all, but we definitely don't acknowledge where we're going to spend eternity. Verse 29 says this, read it. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. And mine has a parenthesis, I want you to read this. For many, many a time it seized him, the, the demon seized him. For he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break out of the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. That it was driving him absolutely crazy. That the demon's main purpose to do with this man was to drive him crazy and to destroy him. Verse 30, Jesus then asked, what is your name? I don't know if you, that's a crazy question, okay? If you believe that Jesus is the son of the most high God, and he's asking a demon, what is your name? Who can ask that question? Only God. Only God himself can be able to answer that question. Only God can be able to say, who are you? And he says this, he said, legion, for many demons have entered him. In other words, he calls himself legion, even though it's not, his name is not legion. He says, we are called legion. We are a multiple demons that are inside of this man. So it's not just one demon. It's multiple demons that are in this man that are causing him to absolutely go crazy and go nuts, to live in a graveyard. For many demons have entered him, verse 31, and they beg him, they begged him, they begged Jesus, not to command, to depart him into the abyss, into nowhere, into nothing. Jesus, don't send us in, just don't destroy us now. They they acknowledge Jesus' power. So he doesn't just have power over sicknesses and diseases that we see there in chapter 8, beginning where he heals the leper, where he heals Peter's mom, where he heals the centurion servant. Then he goes into calming the storm and stopping the storm. And then he stops and he goes and he talks to the spiritual world. And they beg him, don't throw me into the abyss. Don't. Don't destroy me. There's some people who consider this Jesus was weak because Jesus was, Jesus was, he should have. They were saying, well, he should have. He should have destroyed them right then. But he doesn't. Jesus even has compassion even on the demons. Again, only God can do something like that. Verse 31, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Verse 32, now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake. And they drowned. Now there's two people here. There there are these herdsmen that see all this happen. And I, I don't know about you, but either there are people who see this happen and either are excited and and beyond excited for the man who the demon was taken out of, or they look at it and go, he just cost us a lot of money. Jesus just lost us. He just affected my, my, my book. He affected the money in my pocket, and he just killed all these pigs. Who does this guy think he is? Well, he just healed the one man that you guys were all afraid of. Doesn't matter. Do you know what he just did? He just lost us money. 
How many of us, when God tells us or asks us something and it affects our pocketbook, we get going? Because we want to do everything when it comes down to for God. We want to grow in the Lord. We want to do all these things like that. But when it comes down to things and it comes down to our money, God, don't touch my money because that's really my God. These people, that was their God. Verse 34, the herdsmen went back to the city and they told everyone. Look there, verse, verse 34. And when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and they told it in the city and in the country. They, they told this whole idea. They said, hey, this man just healed our demon-possessed guy who lives in our graveyard. But look what he did to all of our pigs. And most likely, this is the main resource for these, for these people. This was the main food item for these people. But even God himself was in their land. And look what they do. They reject him. Look there at verse 35. Then the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone. And I love this phrase. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Hmm. Clothed and in his right mind. And then look what it says. And they were afraid. What were they afraid of? Were they afraid of the mans? Because they used to always be afraid of the mans. They were afraid of the man who, who had the reputation of living in the graveyard, of living in the tombs, of being a madman who would tear apart the shackles if they actually had him chained down. No, they were afraid of God. People are afraid of God. Most of us in this room are still actually really, really afraid. Because when God comes near, we, get, we start getting convicted and we're going, Pastor, you preach about anything but make me feel good. Don't sit here and start tearing me apart because I get torn apart everywhere else. And you're sitting there saying, that's not me. It's God. These people were more afraid of Jesus than they were afraid of the man whom they feared for many years. Look at verse 36. And those who had, had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Verse 37. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were, se they were seized with great fear. So they got into the boat and they returned. While Jesus was in the boat with his disciples, a great storm comes, and it starts coming. He's asleep. They wake him up, and they are filled with fear. Jesus, we're going to die. You've got to do something. He wakes up, says, oh, you of little faith. He calms the storm. What great fear these men had, and they said, what kind of man is this? Then Jesus gets to the shoreline, heals this demon-possessed man, sends the demon into the pigs. The pigs run away, and this is what the people say. Leave. Go somewhere else. Sometimes when God gets close to us, sometimes when God starts to convict us, sometimes when we go to camp as, as a youth kid, we get close to God. But what we really want, God, go away. Go away. You're too much. You've convicted me too much. You're asking me to change. You're asking me to be different. I don't do that, God. We don't do that. We're not going to be that. We're Gentiles. We're not meant for the whole word of God. And he's saying, yes, you are. You are meant for it. Let me finish the reading. Verse 38. Then the man whom the demons had, had gone begged that he might be with Jesus, that he may stay with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home, and de declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. In the recorded history of what we found is this is the first Gentile missionary. That this is the first man that went to the heathens that from this zone 
And he went out and he spread the gospel about what Jesus had done. So, so I think about this. I, I've literally been consumed by this, this story for at least maybe a week and a half. Now I want you to think about it if you were a disciple. And you watch Jesus as he follows. If you think about it right here, he will, he's sitting there and he's preaching this, this sermon on the mount. And this sermon is an unbelievable sermon. It's a sermon that no one can be able to do. He's saying to all the different things about what, what the law says. And he says, no, no, God holds you to a higher standard than that. It's, it's not about if you murder. It's about did you have hate in your heart. If you have hate, then you consider, you consider yourself a murderer. If, if you commit adultery... Or if you lust in your heart, then you are committing adultery. He says, be perfect, like your heavenly father is perfect. So these disciples are coming down that mountain and thinking, we can't do it. There's no way. Then he comes off that mountain. And the first thing he sees, and again, we're replaying this through a disciple's mind. And you think about it. He comes down the mountain, and the first thing he sees is the most disgusting thing that a Jewish person can see, and it's a leper. It's an unclean leper. And that leper, he comes right up to Jesus. He shouldn't even be there. That leper is breaking the law. And he, he comes right up to Jesus and says, will you heal me? And he heals him. And you're going, oh, my goodness. So now he can heal, he can heal lepers. We've never seen a, a cure for leprosy, ever. Who is this man? And then a centurion servant is sick and he's paralyzed. And a centurion or maybe even the leaders come up, to the, come up to Jesus and say this, there's a man that's sick and we need you to heal him. If you just say the words, we know that it will actually be healed. And then he heals this Roman official's servant and never even sees him. What kind of man is this? Then he goes into Peter's house. He sees Peter's mother-in-law um, sick. Again, I don't know if it's hurting Peter or helping Peter, but he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And she immediately gets up and starts to work. And then these two men come up to Jesus and say, hey, we want to follow you. We want to be your disciple. We want to do these things. And he turns them with that way and says, you're not, you don't really quite really mean what you say which is a lot of us in this room, that we say we want to follow Jesus, but we really don't really want to give everything to him. We want to say it with our mouth. We want to show up to church. We want to put on a show, and we want everyone to see our Instagram post of us holding our Bible out or, or doing all these different things out. Or we maybe post scripture, but we have no true belief in what Jesus really stands for. And then he gets the disciples. He's there in Capernaum, in Capernaum, and he takes this trip to the other side of the Galilean Sea. He's there in Capernaum, and he says, guys, let's get on a boat. And you're probably a disciple, and you're thinking, all right, why not? Here we go. You get on the boat, and a storm comes. He's asleep. What's he doing asleep? And then Jesus, the storm comes. Jesus comes out, calms the storm, and your mind is blown what kind of man is this? He heals all these people. He heals the sick. And then he goes and he calms the storm. Why? And then you're asking yourself, Jesus, where are we going? What are we doing? We're going now not even to the Jewish land. The, the Messiah is not meant for those people. He's meant for us. Where are we going? And then you got to think about it. Jesus is thinking this. There's a man we got to go meet. We got to go meet one man. Because there's one man who's lost in the desert. There's one man who's sitting in tombs. There's one man who's acting like a dead man among, lev among other dead men. Which is exactly what we are when we're lost. We were dead in our trespasses and sin amongst all the other people who were dead. And then he goes to that man. And he heals him. But he didn't just heal him. He talked to the demon. The demon calls him the, the son of the most high God. He says, you are God. Don't destroy us. Don't destroy us. 
and sends them to the pigs. The pigs die. If you're a humane, uh, humane society guy, you might be mad about Jesus killing the pigs. But Jesus, Jesus treated animals as if they were here for man. That's exactly how they were made. Man is not here to serve animals. Animals are here to serve men. A lot of people don't like that. Then the people, the herdsmen, leave the town. They go into the town, and we can see that it goes into the city. There's a question mark beside the city because they really didn't know where the city was. It's in this area, though. For when the, where the city is at, this man goes into the cities. They say, listen, they killed all of our pigs. They killed all these things. They come back. And you got to imagine the disciples are sitting there with this demon-possessed man going, hey, what you like? You know, like, what you been up to? No, they don't have anything to say, probably, other than this man is listening to every word his Savior is saying. The people show up, and they say, you got to go. Imagine the disciples. Here's probably what they said, gladly. Can't wait to leave and go home. And that, that man walks up to Jesus and says, take me with you. And he says, no. You go and tell everyone about what Jesus has done. He went that far for one man. He would do the same thing for you and me. How far did Jesus go to get you? How far do you think, how far are you away from God? How, where are you at right now in your life? He will chase you down. There's story after story after story in the Bible. The woman at the well, he wasn't even supposed to go that direction, and he went way detour just to meet that woman. He had an appointment with her. He has an appointment with this man. And it literally says, he leaves the 99. He leaves the crowd to go get the one. The one. That one man. He mattered. And so do you. But here's the difference between us. Is that we walk up to Jesus and say, I want to be your disciple. I want to be your disciple. And then what he says to you is he says, okay, well then go and tell everyone about me. Go tell them. And here's what we do. No, I'm not. I'm not, I don't have the gift of preaching. I don't have the gift of teaching. He didn't ask him that. He said, go and talk about the great things of which God has done. And that's the same thing he's telling us. We're the man. We're the demon-possessed man. Maybe it might not be demons that's in us, but when it comes down to it, it is the sin that's in our lives. We are possessed by our own flesh, by our own sin, and we're the one who's sick. And when Jesus finds you and he finds me and he says, get out. You get to be new. I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to give you a new identity, a new person. You're not who you used to be. And there's so many people in this room, and I hear story after story after story about this is who I used to be. I'm get, listen to me, because Jesus has changed you. Jesus has opened your heart, and you now see. You, you were blind, but now you see. You were lame, and now you walk. You were, you were broken, and now he puts you back together. After this, they just go back to Capernaum. I can't tell you how many times I sat here and read this story and thought to myself going, Jesus, did you go that far for that one man? Yeah. Again, can you imagine being a disciple, sitting on the boat with him on the way back to Capernaum and thinking, who is this man? And now he's talking to demons. So I say this to every one of you. Either today you realize that Jesus sets you free from your sin. He sets you free just like this demon-possessed man. Again, you might not have a demon in you. But sometimes you're just as scary. Sometimes the sin in your life basically has made you into this person that people can't even be around. Maybe it's drinking or, or the way you act with your anger or the what you do. And you have sin that is tearing you apart. And Jesus is saying this, follow me. Come out of the graveyard. Come out of your tomb. Come out of the place where the crazy people are and follow Jesus. 
Or maybe you're a person in this room, and maybe you are a follower of Jesus, or maybe you want to be a disciple, and maybe Jesus has saved you. But what you haven't done is what he asked the man to do, and you don't tell anyone about him. You're this covert Christian who lives at home and tells nothing about what Christ has done in their heart and in their life. And I say this to all of you. Go and tell. Go and tell. The Great Commission says go. The last, it's not a, it's not a reference. It's not a, it's not a, hey, if you feel like it, hey, if you have the gift, it is go make disciples. Go tell. Go tell it on the mountain. And this is what God has called us to. And so, which one are you? If you're not a believer in this room, listen to me, you need to be. If you don't know Jesus, listen, it's, there's no magical prayer, there's no, no, no anything weird, but when it comes down to it, you need to pray, God, I want to serve, I want to follow, I want to be your disciple. If you're a person in this room and you say, hey, I, 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 I know Jesus, but I don't talk about Jesus. I don't live for Jesus when I live outside of this building. Go and tell about all the things that God has done. Let's pray. God, I pray, Lord, that there are people in this room who do not, I know, I, there, there's people in this room who do not know you. Who do not know the power of your saving grace. And God, I pray, Lord, that they would be, that they would see themselves in this story. That they'd see themselves, maybe not as demon-possessed, but God, as as they've been possessed by the sins in their own lives. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would convict that, that soul. That that person has been living by all the different things in this world to be able to try to fulfill their hope with stuff and money and maybe a job, maybe a career, maybe even their own kids. But God, I pray, Lord, that you would save that soul. And God, I pray, Lord, for those who do know you in this room, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would have a rejuvenation of wanting to go and tell of what Christ has done in our lives. For he's healed us. And he's our Savior. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would go and tell that and not be afraid. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would not be like the people of this city. And when God starts to speak to us or he starts to do work in our lives or even around us, that we wouldn't be like, God, get away. God, I pray, Lord, that your work be done in the hearts of men in this room, the hearts of women in this room. God, you are so good and we're not. We do not know what tomorrow holds, but we know you hold it. And God, you are trustworthy because you still save people today. You take us out of the graveyard and you put us at the table with you. In your name we pray, amen. We invite you to stand as we sing in one voice in response. From the ashes, your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light. 
lifting our sorrows and bearing our burdens and healing our hearts. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah to our God we lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice singing hallelujah We sing that our chains have been broken And chains have been broken, and eyes have been opened, an army of dry bones is starting to rise, and death is defeated, for we are victorious, for you are alive. To our God we lift a one voice, to our God we lift a one song, to our God we lift a one voice, singing hallelujah. To our God we lift a one voice, to our God we lift a one song, to our God we lift a one voice, singing hallelujah. seated just for a second. Um, we do actually have a little bit of family business to do. Um, I have to call us into a business meeting right now to be able to vote on our $100,000 remodel of being able to get a youth room upstairs in this building, add storage onto that building so that we can be able to move our children back upstairs. Our main reason is um, we need to be able to have our bigger facilities for our children's and for our youth. And again, if you have any questions for this, what we wanted you to do is we wanted you to come on Wednesday night to be able to ask all the questions and talk to us about this. Um, we, we, we went through the entire thing, the entire hour of, of last Wednesday night, and it just seems like everyone has been just, oh my goodness, that makes total sense. It makes more of an idea to do. So what we're going to do, today we're going to vote on a $100,000 remodel 
that where we create new storage buildings and a new youth room in the main building. I need one person to make a motion to, to do it, Rick Chandler, and I need a second, Tom Watkins, and I want to ask this, all in favor, who was willing? Any, anyone against? Okay. Thank you, guys. Let, let's, let me pray for you, and we will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much, God, for the gifts that you give us. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we use them the right way. And God, I pray, Lord, that we will be willing to be able to give above and beyond what we give already so that we can be able to see the things of this kingdom happen. God, we are grateful and thankful for what you teach us and what you show us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you call us out of the graveyard. And God, that we're willing to go and tell everyone what God has done. Lord, the world that we live in is crazy and filled with fear. But God, we know where our soul belongs, and it belongs to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Guys, you're dismissed. Thank you.